This episode is sponsored by MMS, Missionary Music School. Changing lives one note at a time. Go to mmsforeveryone.com. My name is Porfirio Gueiros, and you're listening to Think and Play. I invited a few of my students, which I call friends, to talk about music. What made that song so special, and what made that song different, and what that song influenced in their lives. If you like music like me, if you're a music enthusiast, this is the podcast for you. So enjoy, have a seat, and let's think about music. Thank you. On this episode, I met with Mario. Mario is an amazing Mexican dude with an amazing family. And Mario's going to share his story. And <laughs> the stories are fantastic. You'll be surprised that this guy at the age of 12 years old, he had to jump the, the wall and cross the border. And it's amazing that the story follows up with God's providing, God's protecting, God's doing what he's good on doing which is preparing Mario for life. And this is what we're going to listen to today. And Mario chose a beautiful song. I'm going to talk about it in the end of the episode. All right, that's it. Have fun. Mario, it's you. Go. Tell me about Mario. Mario's from Mexico. Start from the beginning. I heard that your name is not Mario. Yeah, no, Mar Mar Mario's my nickname. It's like Paul. Ma Paul is my nickname. But Porfirio, nobody calls me Porfirio. I call you of... Porfirio. <laughs> Porf yeah, you do, you do, because that's Porfirio Diaz. It makes him, it's a big <laughs> Mexican dude. And, and so I know that. Mario, Mario, Mario become, became when, you know, when I was working as a waiter, people would ask me for my name, you know, bartending, waiting tables, busing tables, whatever it was in the restaurant. They give you a name tag. And to put Sinue. Mm. Sinue is my real name. Mm. People mispronounce it with chopping. Americans, in general, anybody here in the United States, they want to know what the name is. Uh -huh, what does uh -huh. it mean? Where does it come from? Yeah. Well, at least in my family, it wasn't, oh, we name you this because we never knew. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So when you're busy in a restaurant and you just want to go, 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 you know, it's like, and how it, you know, I still kind of know what it means, but it's not, it's just like two, three different meanings. So I would change my name, you know, Mario. Nobody asked about Mario. No. And, uh, and Mario's like everywhere, Mario! And then the, you're done. Exactly. <laughs> Jose, Pedro, Luis, I used to change the names all the time. Oh, really? Yeah, all the time. <laughs> Whatever name was easier, you know, whenever. Like, I want to start a new place. I just changed the name. That's funny. That. When did you come to America? October 1988. 88. So did you come with your family? I came alone. You came alone? Yeah, I came alone. I was 12 years old. What uh, the heck? Yeah, I didn't. 12 years old and you running away from your country? And country oh, no, I didn't run away. Well, my mom was living here. Okay. My dad, you can't be here anymore. My mom was here already with two of my brothers. Well, three of my brothers. I have to cross illegally, which I didn't even know what, what was happening at yeah, that time. Yeah, of course. You know? Yeah, I mean, it was still legal. Uh. I mean, for us, again, I didn't know what was happening. I didn't, when I, it's like, when I heard you going, you know, my mom was like, well, you're going to have to come with me to the United States. To me, I was imagining, oh man, I'm gonna be living in Disneyland. Uh -huh, uh -uh. You know, I thought everything was lit. You know, all, all I watched was movies in Mexico. You know, yeah. I'm gonna go to the north. One of my aunts was lived in Tijuana. I flew to Tijuana first mm. time in a plane. Dropped me up like a day later. This guy's house, five o'clock or six o'clock in the afternoon. And like yeah, tomorrow morning we we're gonna cross. At the border, we we jump a fence. He told me, change, you know, your name's gonna be Alejandro. Mm. Something happens, your name's Alejandro. So I jump a fence. We ran like about two or three blocks. We got into the car and we drove off. 15 minutes later, you gotta go in the trunk. So we drove for like another half an hour. They took me out and then put back in the back seat. Perfect. And then they asked me, where are you going? I was like, I don't know. I had a, a letter from my mom's address and it was Seattle. I was like, oh, I don't know, I'm not taking it to Seattle. I think he called my mom. She told him to drop me off in Ontario, California, where there was a friend of hers living there with his family. And they were gonna move to Seattle as a whole family. Then I got dropped off there. And then we, two weeks later, we drove up to Seattle and dropped me up at my mom's house. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, <laughs> that's, looking back. That's crazy. Very crazy. And, you know, the, but it wasn't as dangerous as it is. No, yeah, you know, of course, the, you of know, course. Right now, the cartels are running the borders. Yeah. You know, the stories that you hear, yeah. people are like, oh, open borders. People are coming here left and right. No, it's not true. It's not true. No, it's like, it's very dangerous for people to come. Yeah, they do cross, but they spend 
tons and tons of money to cross. 10, 15, 20,000 dollars just to cross the border. They, you get stopped, you, you know, you get sent back. Uh -huh. If another cartel grabs you, they, they see you coming back, they ask you for like a code. If you don't give them a code, they just kidnap you. Oh, wow. And then they'll say, give us $3,000, we'll let you go, $5,000, $2,000, whatever. Then they have to get money from somebody so they can let them go. Otherwise, they'll kill them to the border. Uh -huh. So it's not easy. Yeah. Back then, my mom thinks she paid 300 bucks for me. And it was very easy. My brother would come back to Mexico a couple of times. And he, since he already knew how to cross, he would do it by himself. Oh, really? Yeah. So he didn't have to pay those three, four hundred dollars, whatever they were charging. Uh -huh. He learned. But then it got really hard. And then we didn't get our paperwork shipped until like 1991. Uh -huh, so uh -huh. my mom became a U.S. citizen. And she gave us, was able to get us. Yeah. Papers. Because you're under 16. Blah, 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 yeah. You're under age. 18, yeah. yeah. But um, it's still very extremely hard for Mexicans to become legal in this country. But yeah, I would, if I think back, I would never have my kid go through that, especially now. My mom did it also for my sister. My sister was 14. Just imagine, mm. by herself as well. And that's, it's like, oh. That's so crazy. Very crazy. I mean, but then, you know, the coyotes, were, they were not as bad. They were not, you know, they no, were not yeah, cool people. Yeah. They were uh -huh. actually good people trying to make a living, you know. And it, it was, now it's like kids are getting raped. They get lost. The crossings, instead of being like 15 minutes, 10 minute walk or 10 minute run, whatever. They're like two, three days walking in the desert. My wife did that, actually. She had, she had to cross through the border, I mean, through the desert, like a couple of days walking. They don't stop for you. They don't wait for you. Now it's like, if you don't, if you want to stay, you stay. We'll keep on going. We, we cannot stop for you. Okay. Are you got no more water? Oh, I'm sorry. We go. You find people dead on the desert dead. all the time. Dead. I'm just glad, thank God, that we're we're here. That we don't have to, you know, bring my family or my kids. Uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Working in restaurants, I, okay. I would help friends open up restaurants. In Spokane, you know, Idaho, uh -huh. Louisiana. Uh -huh. I mean, just travel around, just okay. open up restaurants. Okay. So how did the handling people came to you? Because this is, I, I believe that people want to listen. How did you get to this point? What you are today, you have a nice house, you have a nice family. I always felt like I'm mean, blessed. I, mean, I do, I did have, I always felt like I had the, uh, I don't know if it was with my dad or, I don't know, with the way we grew up, but I always felt like a strong person. I never felt weak. I never felt somebody, felt like a leader type of deal, uh -huh. where I didn't have to rely on anybody. If I wanted something, I just just go and grab it. I wanted to go reach for it, you know. And then getting married was a big help. Well, actually, one of the things that I think made me be a man is when my mom kicked me out. It was like, well, she didn't really kick me out. I was like, I used to say, well, but I'm time I'm 18, I'm gonna do whatever you want. You uh. cannot stop me. And she was like, oh, wait, wait until 18. If you want to do whatever you want, leave the house. Uh. And I was like, okay. So I left the house. I was 16 years old. My mom thought I was a joke. Uh. I called my friend, hey, mom. I became a victim. My mom kicked me out. Uh. I need a place to stay. <laughs> so I moved in with them. And uh. now this time, I mean, I did a lot of horrible things. I didn't see my mom for so many years that I had no respect for her. You uh -huh, know? Uh -huh. Like there was no, no bond. Yeah. yeah. And, and I was just, and I wanted to be a rat. I wanted to become free, you know, like I wanted to be older. Uh -huh, you know, uh -huh. my other brothers were 16 and 17, and I wanted to do the things they were doing. I would leave the house, you know, and I'd come back home for three, four, five days, you know, go to school from my friend's house, and she gave me that liberty, you know, but then, like, don't do that, you know, don't do this, don't do that. And I'm like, I'll do whatever I want. Uh -huh. Because of my dad was a lot of uh, oppression type, you know, do this, only do that, you cannot go outside and play outside. Dad, can I go play soccer outside the house? No. And if you say yes, it was like, okay, for five minutes. Uh, oh, wow. Like five minutes. Uh. So I would leave for like an hour, two hours. Literally, I was just outside the house. But just because I didn't come back inside the house in five minutes, he with me. I used to hate that. You know, I used to wish my dad death. I mean, like, oh, come on, why don't you just die? Uh. And here, you know, I guess a little bit older. My mom wasn't as harsh as he was. Well, my mom wasn't harsh at all. But then like, she kicked me out. Uh. You know, I was a victim. My mom kicked me out. And I, but it, I did become a man mm -hmm. at 16 years old. Uh, then I have the responsibility to pay rent, bills. Then I have to buy a car, you know, keep a, a job. But I think that was the, what made me a man. Uh, I started, I was working at Jack in the Box, restaurants, you know, passing tables. I guess I'm always working for somebody, but I knew, you know, in any restaurant, I was always the youngest kid. So I, I used to hang around with all the older people, which I think right now our society need that. I mean, the kids need to be hanging around with older people, not just kids their age. Yeah. And for me, kids their age, sometimes they're, my son will be playing with guys that are 35, 40, 40 years old. To me, those are still kids. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Get off your video game, get off your, your butt, you know, get off your couch yeah. and do something for your life, you know. And that's what I think kids, you know, I think my son will have a better relationship maybe with, with an, another other adult somebody that you know things like me but it's not me mm. you know so i want to direct my son to be working with other guys a mentoring mentoring yes we, we always need somebody to mentor Correct. always it, it doesn't matter what age true exactly <laughs> that's very true <laughs> but for me my son you know yeah I'm, if i take him to work with me teaching what i do it'll be horrible you know i don't have the patience mm -hmm. he's still my son 
and he's only 13, but I want him to start working with my guys, and then they can teach him. They can push him. They can, you know, make him sore. Well, uh -huh, uh -huh. I tell my guys, I want him to go to work with you guys. Make him cry. Make him suffer. Make him, you know, <laughs> get blisters. Make him want to, you know, want to quit the job that day. But he won't do it. Uh -huh. I know he's a strong kid. Like, he will not admit that he's, you know, he's he's struggling, uh -huh, uh -huh. but he will with me. So that's one of the things that I think that make me successful in a way, because I, again, I was always with older people. They have better cars than me. They had a, a house. They had a wife. They uh -huh. have, you know, they have yeah, family. They have a structure. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And for me, I didn't have anything. You know, so I always want. I was like, I'm gonna be like that. I want to do that. I want to have what they have. But at that time, you know, when I was young, I want to have a restaurant. You know, nobody will give a chance. Cause I went, you know, 17, 18, 19, 20 years old. Who wants to give just a kid? You know. Yeah. Um, and then I started working in the flooring and construction. And then from there, I mean, I saw construction. Of, I was 24 years old. Well, I, started, I did it when I was 19, helping some friends that I was making no money. Like, they were making like $50 a day, $60 a day. Ah, I can make that in tips. So I left. And then I met some, another guy was like, oh, yeah, I do construction, I do flooring. I was like, dude, I used to do flooring. It was carpet, actually. But, so we like, why don't we just create a company together? So then we did it. I quit the restaurant. My wife was like, why would you want to quit the restaurant? Was, I'm done. Uh, I'm gonna work in construction. Don't quit, you know, wait, how if we don't make it? How oh, where can I make it? The first month, I doubled what I was making as a, as a waiter. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And then I was like, man, this is, I saw the checks. Yeah. Like, dude. And then I got really hungry. I bought another van. Uh -huh, I got, uh -huh. you know, I, I hired two other guys. And then I made another, you know, another crew, another fan, and I just started grew from there. I mean, a lot of them failed. I was like, oh, why did I hire these guys? You uh -huh, know? Uh -huh, of course. But I got to a point where I, I started getting really good contractors, you mm -hmm. know, and I, they were not even my employees. And then I was a lot of struggle. And then, but a lot of them were successful. So I was making really good money, like crazy amounts uh. of money. I was a lot, but it was a lot going on. You know, my, my, my mind was always, it was nice to see those big checks. That's true. I think one of the things that made me an entrepreneur, you know, where it was my dad was actually, I, I wanted to be the opposite of what my dad was. Uh. So my dad was always about school. My dad, you have to study. You have, there's nothing, you know. He will not let me go play, so I have to read a book. Uh -huh. I have to write. I have to, you know, study math. And it's like it was horrible. Uh, I hated it. Okay. You know, coming to the United States, still scared of my dad. I have to study. I hate school. In Mexico school is a lot better than the United States. So yeah. to say, uh -huh. that, you know, uh -huh. here, you know, and also because my dad would put a lot of stuff ahead of my my time. So when I came to the United States, seventh, eighth, ninth grade, I was a straight A student. I was still scared of my dad. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I still have to be, you know, good in school. I have to until I hit my sophomore years, my tenth year. I said, screw this. I don't. I, I, my dad's not here anymore. Because how much I hated school. So my dad wanted me to become a civil engineer. Always have hopes just to become a career. His mind was, you will never be successful in life if you don't study. If you don't study, yeah. If you don't go to school, you have to become somebody, you know, to work for those companies. But now it changed. Yeah. So for me, I think that was one of the pushes where. I did not want to be an employee because I, you know, I was I never liked people pushing me around, mm -hmm. and my dad was very um, aggressive, pushy around, <laughs> well, and aggressive also in words and, uh, and physically. You know, not, not not so much like beating me to death. Right uh -huh, now, but uh -huh. I didn't. When I grew up, I became very uh, defensive. Defensive. Somebody yeah. wants to yell at me, then I become angry. Do not yell at me. Do not raise your voice. You uh -huh. know, stuff like that. So I became very, very aggressive in a way, and I didn't like that. Everything was against what my dad would yeah. teach me. I wanted to become my own boss. I didn't want anybody, no, nobody to be above me ever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think that's one of the things that we said, you know, I have to also deal with people. And I did not want to be like my dad as far as pushing me. And my dad was really good with other people, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, my dad, you know, people was very likable. They all were Charisma. Like, charisma. Charismatic. Charismatic. With yeah. other people. He bet a lot. So, I mean, my dad was, grand, my grandparents were very wealthy. And then he lost it all. Mm -hmm. he, he used to do a lot of betting, you know. And many women, too. By the time I, I didn't see any of those fruits of my grandparents uh -huh. or great-grandparents, uh -huh. you know. But I, I, that was my whole point. I did not want to be... Whatever my dad wanted me to be, I did not want to be that. But he did not take the time to, like you did, you know, you only, well, you only had two kids. Right? Yeah. I don't know if it's an excuse for my dad. He had more than more than ten. More than ten. <laughs> but uh, he, you know, you don't know what that he didn't have time for us to study. Uh -huh, That's uh -huh. what we wanted. Yeah. So you're gonna be a doctor. You're gonna be a nurse. Or you're gonna be a industrial engineer. You're gonna be a. Um, <laughs> if you're in school, you have to be the best ones you can. Yeah. Be. Okay. Like I don't accept a, a B. You're in high school. Your whole focus right now in life, right now, as it's a 14, studying. 15, 16 year old, is school. Uh -huh. And you have to be the best. Yeah. You, you cannot come to me and say, I have a D or a B or a C. Like, that's stupid. You have to be the best as what you're doing. That's my home mentality. Uh -huh. If you're going to uh -huh. be playing football, be the best. Football. Be the best. If you're going to be playing piano or singing, you have to be the best. And I just, I, I mean, in that way, I'm kind of hard on my kids because, and sometimes they come, oh, I got this. 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know what I mean? I got a B. I got a, like, well, that's, uh, wait, were you proud of that? You know, I know some kids don't have it, but if I, I, I want to say to my kids, you don't have to go to school. You don't have to, you know, to be successful. If you want to, go for it. It's not necessary. At least in this country, it's not necessary. Yeah. In Mexico, it is. In maybe, Brazil, maybe in yes. Brazil, it is. Yeah. You know, if you want to get a job washing dishes, they'll pick whoever has the best education. Uh-huh. You know, that's unfortunate. Or if you're old, if you're 30 years old, 35, then you wouldn't get hired anymore. But here in the United States, we're blessed. Basically, you can do whatever you want. Yeah, true. You know, so I tell kids, you know, when you're 18, 17, and 19, 20, change careers if you want. You know, try to work on something. If you don't like it, quit the job. Go something else. Sometimes, you, you know, because you never know in college if you're actually going to like what you study. The theory is nice. Oh, I'm uh-huh. gonna be, they say, oh, I want to be an industrial engineer. I want to be an aerodynamic engineer. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Sounds cool. But once you start doing it, like, oh, I don't like this. Yeah. This is horrible. And, but you, now you wasted seven, eight, nine years of your life. So for me, I think they should be creating academies. You know, like if you're going to become a lawyer, academy for law, academy for medicine. They only teach you what you need to learn. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Instead of why would you need well, and a stupid... Gender studies, <laughs> like wow. <laughs> Why would you even want to study stuff like that? Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, Paloma. You know, all kids are different. Like Paloma, you know, she's working. You know, but I think Miranda's a little bit more aggressive as far as money. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, uh, and she saves more money. I think you know the way I, I see them. And uh, Junior is very proud of making money, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. he wants to spend his money on whatever he wants. Mm-hmm. Right. So they, they all have the little... Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. But I do want them to struggle. I want, I want them to learn and earn the money. Perfect. Yeah, you, you want to teach them how to work. You want yeah. to teach them... A, it's a responsibility. Exactly. Yeah. You know, you have to go to work. You have to be you have to be on time. Yeah. Uh, Paloma, last... When she was 17, she started working. She started working a week later. She's like, I don't like that. I want to quit. No, no, no. Mm-mm. You're not going to quit. Mm-mm. Those people took the time to hire you, to train you. They spend money on you. So they're losing money in you training right now. And you're just going to quit? No, no, you're not quitting. Uh-huh. You're going to keep on doing it. But at least give them their money back. So she worked the whole summer. And then she was glad that she didn't quit. You know, all her friends quit. And they go, oh, well, because my friends are all in the summer. I don't care. <laughs> you chose to go to work. And now you give them back their money. So, yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah. So yeah, she's doing the same job now two, two years later, three years later. She's in college. Part, you know, works part-time still, but at least she earns her money. One time I was talking to a person and I was telling him about school, you know, where and they asked me, what about your daughter? Will you take her to work in flooring? It's like, why not? I can teach them what I do. Uh-huh. If they like it, good for them, you know? It's like, but anybody can do what I do. Anybody, it's not a big deal. Teach them how to do flooring, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's like, there's like, well, this, this family, is, they do tile. They took all the kids to, to do tile and they're not, they never went back to school. I said, but, at the end of the day, are they making money? Yeah, but they didn't go back to school. What is school? What do you need school for? Mm. To make money in life, right? To provide for your family, to provide for your kids, to provide to buy a house. What's the big deal? Yeah, a tile setter cannot be 80 years old and be doing tile. Mm. 70 years old can do tile. A doctor can be a doctor when they're 70. That's the only advantage I'd see on it. It's not, you know, they like the trade. They start making money. They didn't go into debt for, I don't know, 100000 300000 whatever they're going to debt for. They start making money right away. They start feeding their family. And it's really good money. As a, as a flooring guy, I make way more money than, than the uh, architect, than the uh, designer of the building, than the superintendent of the building. Yeah, they have the nice titles. They have their, their you know, I see their diplomas uh-huh, on uh-huh. the back wall. Beautiful. I like it. I'm just a laborer. I make more money than they do. Uh-huh. And in a way, I kind of feel good about it. But then they're still paying all their debt. So I tell my kids, you don't have to become successful. So at the end of the day, to get older is to provide for your family. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It is different maybe for a woman. Could be. I, I don't see why it should be as, as hard for a woman. I, because, but, but do women, do, they do have the different interests. You know, men, they like more what we do, you know, Hands more hard work. Yeah. Women can't do this or stuff like that either. Or, you know, they're, they're not as strong as men are. Mm-hmm. So I can see that, why, you know, this lady was telling me about those kids. But I want my, my daughters to be a wife mm-hmm, mm-hmm. my whole life. You know, yeah, if you, have, if you can help your husband, help them. Help them. But oh. we are raising them to be a wife. Mm-hmm, Hopefully, mm-hmm. you know, a good wife for, for their husbands. But that's why I told my daughters, you can, I can teach you what I do. Uh-huh, you yeah. can go to school if you want to go to school. Because, yeah. yeah, it will be a help for the husband. You know, they get struggle. She can always get a, get a job. Life goes full, 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 full. They will prepare themselves. Uh-huh. Not, you know, I'm not talking about you just yeah. going to be a wife. Yeah. Your whole problem is to cook and feed your kids. No. You get your career, get your whatever you want to do. So I don't want them to get married at 20, 24, you know. I don't know, whatever they want to. Yeah. I mean, for me, I don't, now I'm like, I don't, it's your life. But I do want them to get prepared for life. But to have in mind that they are going to be a wife. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The idea of being a traditional wife, the yeah, normal always the, wife, uh -huh, you know, uh -huh. where you support your husband. That is, to me, it's it's God's way of doing it. You know, it's God's, yeah. you support your husband, whatever you uh -huh, do, uh -huh. be a wife. I mean, a wife doesn't mean just, like you said, stay home yeah. and, and feed your kids, whatever. But to support your husband. Yeah. So that's my whole thing. And, and if the husband says, oh, yeah, stay home, take care of the kids. So good. It, yeah, good. Because men were not good for them. I mean, there are some men that are. Uh -huh, yeah. we, I cannot handle my kids for I, more than, than, than two hours by themselves when they were kids. Like, come on, you know, <laughs> ah, please take me out of here. You know, but women do. You know, if, if, if look look at the toys that kids and, and kids play, right? So little girl, they give him a doll. Uh huh. Yeah. And the little girl stressed out, taking care of the baby. Uh -huh. shh, 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 shh. Oh, my baby, my baby. <laughs> Boys are in the truck, wow, I'm crashing yeah. stuff. You know, we, they're we, we're raising the girls. The girls are in their it's in their nature to be mothers. Nature. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not bad. To, but a wife has to support her husband. Uh huh. That's my whole idea. Yeah. Whole, but again, you know, if you want to become a lawyer, if you want to become some be the best. Go yeah. for it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But true. you have to be the best. Try to be number one. You know, that's your whole goal. I remember that we got to him at church 13 years ago. Uh, your wife came in like five years later. So you're talking about 2014. And the whole church started praying for you. Mm. Tell me that story. What happened between 2010? <laughs> <laughs> well, growing up, I was not a Christian, right? So I was Catholic. Uh -huh. Which Catholic is very easy to be Catholic. There's no... No fear, not you know. You can do whatever you want yeah. as long as you do the cross thing on your, and you're good. Then I met my wife, and I was like, oh, I, you know, I liked her. I mean, I loved her from the beginning. You know, and but when you're a kid, you know, you always want to think about sex. Uh -huh. She wouldn't allow it. Nothing, you know. We were just holding hands, kiss here and there, but no sex at all. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, to me, I was like, oh, maybe in a week. You know, ten days, five days, whatever. I'll give a few days. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, two and a half years until we got married. And then it happened, you know, after we got married. I could not be, you know, I could not be her husband unless if I was Christian. So her mom did not like me. I mean, I don't know if she didn't like me or not, but I assume she didn't. Because mm -hmm. I was not a Christian. So she would talk to me about God, you know. I would listen. I did like it, you know. And you learn. And I, I had that little craving now about uh -huh. God. We, we came down to get married. I had to get baptized. I had to. Uh -huh. Not because I wanted to. But the priest or the, not the priest, the, uh, the, the pastor, pastor would not marry us unless I was baptized. So I got baptized. It was good for a couple of years, you know, go to church. But then I never found a church that I really liked. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You know, the, the Mexican ones or the Spanish ones that are too religious. Oh, you have to dress a certain way. Okay. You have to act a certain way. And I was feel horrible because I am a horrible person. You know, in my head and my mind, I know who I am. It's like, man, I can never become a Christian. All these people are way too nice. And then times, and so I stopped going to church all of a sudden. Just, well, I don't want to go anymore. And uh, it was easier to be away from God because you can do more things, you know, or, or be whatever you want. Yeah. If you don't have the fear of God, but I always had it, right? I was like, God. And my wife would be like, come to church, come to church. Like, no, I'm not going to go to church. And I, was, I would tell her, you know, one time I told her, the more you ask me to go to church, the less I'm going to go to church. Yeah. So you, you stop. It goes, back to, my... it goes back to her father's relationship. Yes. The more you tell me, the more. The more <laughs> I'm My real soul alike. Huh? We are so alike. Yeah. <laughs> no idea. Yeah. yeah. The more you told me to do something, I will never, I'll do it less. <laughs> Until I'm ready, I will do it. 2012 mm. was extremely horrible for me. That's where I think I got the most challenge, where, you know, the economy went down. Well, it started going down in 2008. In 2008, yeah. 8, 9, 10, but those were my strongest years. Uh -huh. Those were my best years yeah. financially until 2012. I bought another house, I bought a boat, I bought another car. It was like, because I was doing really well. Mm -hmm. And then it just, boom, boom. Yeah. It hit me. And I went to my wife, you have to get a job. So I had to ask for help. And I, you know, I went through some troubles with one of my brothers, like horrible. I mean, the things that I told my brother, was like, I, I did apologize to him. I did ask for forgiveness for them, for what I said. I also asked God for forgiveness because it was some horrible things that I said. Mm. I mean, things that you might not even think about saying them, I said them. And then 2013, Paloma comes to me, my oldest daughter, she's like, Dad, it was Father's Day. He's like, why don't you come to church with us? Come to church with us today, please. And she was a child, you know, like, I don't know, she may be eight years old, nine. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, I'll go with you guys. And we came to English church. Uh -huh. Everybody was so nice. It was like very relaxed. You, you know, nobody was wearing a suit. Nobody was wearing a tie. It was just like <laughs> there's some people wearing, you know, pajamas. And it was nice. It was like, this is what a church, I think, should be like. You know, uh -huh. I, I'm not going to expect my kids to come to my house wearing a suit and tie on. Yeah. I'm coming to my dad's house. So I will say, come in, son. I, be I, yourself. Oh, be yourself, you know. 
whatever, you know, it's perfect. And then I saw a couple, oh, a guy up there, Sash, and I was like, oh, I know that guy. And then I started talking to him later. He didn't recognize me because like, we worked in stores, like in the flooring. Uh-huh, uh-huh. We kind of saw each other, but never in the setting. It took me a while to figure out who he was. Uh-huh. But he was on stage. He was like, oh, I know. <laughs> and then when I talked to him, he's like, it took like maybe two, three minutes before two. I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. I seen you here. <laughs> <clears throat> and I did like the, the, the preaching. And I really enjoyed it. Pastor John was, you know, one of my favorite people where he's very good at teaching. Yeah. Straight to the point, no BS. Yeah. Boom, 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 <clears throat> boom. If he hurts, he hurts. If he doesn't hurt, doesn't hurt. He doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So I like that. You know, then I went again <clears throat> the next week, and like you said, my wife will pray for me to yeah. come to church. I didn't know about this. She shared with us. She shared, yeah. yeah. And I guess Pastor John told, you know, don't worry about it. Mars gonna start coming soon. Like, you know, <laughs> I guess he prophesied it, uh-huh. and I start coming. I started getting more and more, and then I got more interested on it, you know, just, oh, it was relieving. I still felt like I was not as good enough as, the, as yeah. everybody uh-huh. else. I was like, man, these people are better than me. It's like, oh, man, I'm a horrible person. I will never become like them. I will never become a Christian. I will never, because all I saw this picture of these people. Yeah. Then I started coming to what they call the CGs. And then from CG, it's like, oh, man, these people are just as bad as I am. <laughs> so I started feeling it, you know, because I was like, okay, they, they, they go through the same struggles as uh-huh. I am. Um, another time where it hit me hard, where it was like, you know, maybe like two months, three months after being in church, I said the worst word, you know, I accepted my Jesus, you know, as my Lord and Savior. So I got saved. Again, you know, I don't know if it's pride or feel a weakness to cry or to uh-huh. ask for things. Uh-huh. I always felt like it's it's a, it's a weakness. It's a weakness. You do not ask for it. You do not, you know. There was you fight for it. You <clears throat> go oh, yeah. for it. Exactly. For go me, get it. Yeah, for me, it's like, you don't cry. That's, that's not for men, you know. So I was in, in church one time, and Pastor John's like, does anybody have a need, you know, or just raise your hand? And I was like, nah, I can't raise my hand. <laughs> so I did not raise it. Mm. I, and I, I assumed that lights were off. I mean, my eyes were closed. You know, we're supposed to be praying, raise your hand, nobody's going to see, nobody's going to judge, just raise your mm. hand if you need for something. I'll come to you, you know. So everybody closed their eyes. Four or five seconds after he said that, <clears throat> I didn't raise my hand. He comes to me, put his fingers on my forehead. He was like, I know you want to ask. I know you're asking for this. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> so good. It, it was... You know, <clears throat> my whole body got the chills. And he was like, man. So he started praying over me. He was like, I know you're asking for these things. Don't worry about it. It will happen. You know, it's going to happen. And it's like, if that's not God, then it's not God. Who is? So it, <clears throat> it was like, <clears throat> that's when it's like, I even fell more in love with Jesus. Yeah. Because he spoke to me when I needed him. And I didn't ask for it. And I, I asked for it in my head. Yeah. In my, you know, it was like. In your heart. In your heart. And so. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit was like. Boom. Exactly. So I know he didn't go to anybody else. It was mm-hmm. three seconds, five seconds after he said, raise your hands, you know. And he came to me. Like, oh. oh, oh. <laughs> it was. So then, yeah, from there on, we started coming every week. Um, it was 2013. It was like, okay, God, if you are who you say you are, and you know, if we give, you will multiply. So I, so I start multiplying, you know, like, I'm going to trust you. Because, you know, we didn't have that much money back then. Mm-hmm. And like I say, it was only a, a small amount of time where I started giving to church. I was like, okay, I'm going to challenge you. I trust you. I'm going to trust you that you are going to multiply. I will write checks down for my guys. I think I told you the story, but I would write my checks to my subcontractors, to my employees, to my guys. You know, so I start writing checks. I do it. I look at my accounts. Like, let's say I have $20,000. Mm. And I'm writing $40,000 worth of checks. Like, dude, they're going to bounce. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to send them. Because mm. I have to trust. I will send the checks out. Nothing bounce. I will open out the bank account and I have an extra, an extra ten thousand dollars. <laughs> like, I mean, I, I, I know God provided, uh-huh. you know, but I, I know it's logical. I can go back and see where the money came from at the time and it ended. But I still say I'm gonna send the checks out. I don't have the money right now, but God will provide them. Yeah. And I will get the, you know, maybe a check coming early or whatever, whatever it was. And it's deposited. And then from there, you know, the next pay period, where next period, I wasn't even worried about paying the checks. I always extra money, always extra. You know, we paid off our house in three and a half years, or three years, my wife and I. Wow. She helped me, you know, so we were paying extra. So we uh-huh. paid off our whole house. And then except from there on, just, uh, it's been, it's been just a blessing. There's no... No doubt in my mind that God has been in my life my whole time. Mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. know, through praying, my, you know, just by doing the thing that God likes to do with, you know, I don't know what you guys call it. We call it presinar. You know, where you, uh-huh. where you do the cross on your, on your, on your body. But my wife would pray for us, for me. My, yeah. my mother-in-law would pray for me when I was a kid. You know, it was we would be praying for our kids. Now we pray for our kids yeah. and our, our kids, pay our husbands and wives, their our grandchildren. Mm-hmm. They don't have them, but we pray for them. They used to do that. 
easy. But that's until you know about who Jesus is. Like, you know, for me, I, if I go back in my life, the things that could have happened to me, not, not what happened, could have happened, you know, where I was close to death, close to something, uh -huh. you know, accidents. I go back, it's like, man, why did that not happen to me? Yeah. You know, I know it's through prayer because I don't see any other way um, where, you know, we're, we were in, in an accident where people died and nothing happened to me. Just a little drop of blood in my uh -huh. ear from a little glass, insignificant piece of glass where everybody's lose their teeth or someone can walk, like I said, three people died. Nothing happens to me. And it was repeatedly, I go back, it's like, dude, or even wish, like, man, imagine if I would've gone that day where my best friend was put in jail for 20 years. You're crossing the border. Crossing the border, exactly. That's, that's a <clears throat> life-threatening thing, moment. You're 12 years old. But, because, but God had, God, the chess player, he had the plan for you right here, 2023. So he was protecting you in 1988. Sure. Because he had a plan for you here. Yeah, I mean, in high school, my best friend, like he just got out of prison. He was 20 years in prison. Wow. His cousin is still in jail. They gave him 54 years. What the heck? 16 years old. Wow. You know, my other buddy also, 10 years. It's like, the choice that we make as kids, could, you know, could, I mean, look at, I mean, my best friend was a straight A student. He had a yeah. full right a scholarship to go to uh, Utah. But we, since we started ganging, you know, we were in little gangs. Uh -huh. The stupidity happens, you know? Yeah. So, that, you know, we were supposed to go to high school in North Seattle. His cousin brought a gun and started shooting. A drive-by oh. shooting, killed a little girl. You know, not even the guy that we were supposed to get, you know, just sort of an innocent little girl. He gets tried as an adult. That day I was supposed to go with him. I didn't go. Wow. I had to go to work. Uh. So they dropped me off at my, at my work while they went to the high school. We were supposed to be just to beat up a kid, you know, or beat up a couple of kids, whatever, mm -hmm. because there was like 10 of us. But my, but my friend, best friend, I know you have to go to work. So he dropped me off at work and then they left over there. And I was like, imagine if I would have gone with them. Who knows what would have happened? Oh, yeah. I was safe. I was put to the side for that mm -hmm. uh, restaurant where, you know, a guy used to pull up a gun and start shooting in the air. I left like five minutes before. Uh, and I got another guy suicide in another restaurant. You know, kicked everybody out, pointing guns out of it. Ten minutes before I left. After I left. Left. Oh, wow. Again, so many, you know, I've been around drugs, uh, dealing drugs, you know. Never, not once touched them. I didn't do any drugs. My cousin's getting caught. My brother's getting caught. Where the day before I left, they were going to look for me because I was hanging around with them the day before. My brother, you know, he got put in jail. Got caught selling drugs. They went to my house looking for me. But I had left that day before. Actually, not even the day, the same day. Mm -hmm. I was with him the day before, and I was going to get married. Um, and so I left to Mexico that morning at 6 in the morning. He gets caught at like 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Wow. So I was just like, just like little, little inches away of being, oh my God. I mean, it's like, and I was go back and see, and it's like, hey. I, I can't call it luck. No. You know, it's not, and it's like, I it's know. Not it's, it's not coincidence. It's not coincidence. coincidence. I know it's no. God's way of doing it. <clears throat> and I was told, another friend of ours, and, you know, I was like, I know I'm God's, my, I'm God's favorite son. Uh -huh. Because I know what I go through. I know the things that I do, the things that I've done. And for me to escape a lot of those things, like, man, it's like, I, or sometimes I'm even driving, and, I'm, and I think, you know, my mind goes, uh -huh. and it's like, I think I lived this moment before. And I think God rewinded the time. And to make it better for me, uh -huh, you know, uh -huh. where like maybe I go off the road and I, I die or, or become a paralyzed or whatever happens. And I, and I do believe that God returned the time for me uh -huh. and chose a different path. Kind of like, you know, maybe I went to the high school at one point and, yeah. and, and then I'm, I'm there in jail for 10 years. Yeah. Never met my wife, never got married, never, you know. Yeah. And I think he rewinded the time and told my, my best friend to drop me off at work. I do believe God does things Of like course, that. it was the Holy Spirit saying, hey, get out of here. Yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. I know, you should go to, go home now. Um, I get friends from getting drunk. That's amazing. And, and what's amazing is that you don't have to be Christian to be to, to have that. Now you recognize today oh. as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ, not the Christian religions people, as a follower of Jesus Christ, and you, you understand the Holy Spirit. Now you understand that the Holy Spirit was already talking to you and speaking to you and saying, hey, don't do this. And then, it is, uh -huh. um, well, my dad was anything but religious. He had nothing to do with God. Uh -huh. Not ever since to church. My mom never. Even, well, my mom left when I was, you know, I think five years old. Left my dad, uh -huh. and, and I see her until I was twelve. So we didn't have that 
any any kind of a spiritual Spirit, or, yeah, you know, yeah. God teaching. Which you know, you do the they baptize you, you first communion, you do those things. You, know. you go to Easter you know, or whatever. No, not, not that's it. just baptisms and you know the, the, and the so you don't die. You don't die pagan. You don't go to purgatory. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and I mean, and uh, at least it's a teaching. I didn't yeah. have that, you know. I was like, oh, I have to do it. So you, you go to those teachings, and then you know, you're six years old, and you forget about it. Yeah. I know it was through prayer, and I used to wish to see those things. Like, why didn't I? Why wasn't I there? Uh -huh. And you know, when you're a stupid kid, you know, like I wish I would have been with my friends. I, I, I had to be there. Why didn't I go? Or like, man, why didn't I see that guy shoot himself? Yeah. I wanted to see it. A, a huge fight broke down in a restaurant or, or in a wherever. I was like, I missed that scene. Why didn't I see oh, it? Oh, wow. It's like, come on. Or, you know. I missed all the food. I missed it. <laughs> like, what happened? You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> Even even when you talk about so Mexicans, they they believe a, a lot like in um, ghosts. You know, uh -huh. I wanted to see ghosts. I wanted to see uh, the devil. Uh -huh. like, I, wanted, you know, I wanted to know if it really exists. Instead of asking God, I was so worried about it. I was always put aside. I can tell you, I've never struggled. Uh -huh. I never had any issues really. I mean, I, I mean, I might have some. Again, I almost felt blessed. Yeah. And I look back. I feel like always my life, my life has been good. I feel sorry for my wife that she married me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's a uh, there's a lot of things that I know I I skipped or the what was put aside. Put aside for God, mm -hmm. protecting you, guiding you exactly. before you even know it. Before and, and realizing it was already yeah. before you even realize that. That's amazing. Yes, it is. <laughs> Mario, thank you. Thank you. God. <laughs> Your head, bro. Jesus, thank you for Mario. Now, oh, give me a real name. Okay, thank you for Sinaway, this born child that was protected by you, was guided by you, and brought from all the way from Mexico to your kingdom, not to America, to your kingdom. That's the most important thing. It doesn't matter where we are born at. It matters where we belong to, and we belong to the kingdom of heaven. This is where we belong. This is our homeland. Thank you. Thank you for his family. Bless his kids, his wife. Bless this home. In Jesus' name, amen. What a testimony. Well, Mario chose this song called La Incondicional by Luis Miguel. This is a love song, to be honest. It's a declaration of love that Jesus has for us, that it's unconditional love. It doesn't matter who we are, how we are, God always loves us. And this is what this song is about. I also believe that it's a song that he chose because the unconditional love that he has for his wife and vice versa. So, Incondicional by Luis Miguel. God bless you. Siempre tú, amistad, ternura que sé yo, tú, mi sombra has sido tú, la historia de un amor que no fue nada, tú, mi eterna mente, tú. Un hotel, tu cuerpo y un adiós Tú, mi oculta amiga, tú Un golpe de pasión Amor de madrugada No existe un lazo entre tú y yo Nada de amores Se puede.
Alright, thank you for listening to our podcast Think and Play. If you have any questions, shoot us an email, thinkandplay2222 at gmail.com. Subscribe for more episodes. We're going to have lots of more to come. Peace out. Thank you, people. Bye. Love you.